available on the call. Uh, looks like we're currently having a little bit of an issue unmuting people. So for now, we're gonna everybody is gonna remain muted. And uh, definitely, if you have any questions, I encourage you to use the chat feature in the webinar. Um, Rebecca is here with me today. She's gonna be uh, assisting me with asking and asking the questions so we can get all your relevant questions answered. Also, we have um, Chris Brown with the Exchange here, and she's going to be um, doing a short presentation on navigating qualified health plans. So for today's agenda, we're going to be going over a really similar regiment from last time. We're going to be going into hot topics, health plan finder updates, healthcare authority updates, new outreach materials, and that's actually also going to include um, outreach strategies. We're going to be taking a look at a, a couple of different things there, and then we're going to move into the section that's going to be presented by Chris, which is navigating qualified health plans. So I want to let you know that some of the topics that you're going to be hearing today were um, either developed in part or from questions that were taken from navigator requests. So, um, you know, definitely a reminder that if you have anything that you'd like to see in these webinars, any questions you'd like us to incorporate, um, any strategies around how we're presenting material, definitely encourage you to, to bring it to us. We'd love to incorporate it, um, get your feedback, make it a better tool for you guys. Um, with that, we're just going to move right along into hot topics. So I really wanted to talk about DREAMers because immigration continues to be a topic that leaves many people seeking some additional information. So firstly, I wanted to talk about uh, you know the DREAMers. These are people who are not eligible for insurance through the exchange. So what does this mean? It means they cannot buy qualified health plans through the exchange, and they are not eligible for advanced premium tax credits, and they are not eligible for Washington Apple Health. Because they are ineligible to receive these benefits, they are exempt from the individual mandate to have insurance, and they are also exempt from the penalty associated with not having that insurance. Um, so the National Immigration Law Center clearly states that DREAMers are ineligible for insurance through, a, through an exchange, so that would be state or federal. Um, it's important to note that this population does have some of that limited access to insurance, so they can seek insurance through off exchange insurance services. However, they will not have access to resources like health insurance premium tax credits or cost sharing reductions. And as we know, both of these do function to make healthcare purchasing more affordable. Um, clients, so, you know, clients who have visas, though, they are potentially eligible for Washington Apple Health or qualified health plans with tax credits. However, most visa holders will probably only be eligible for qualified health plans with tax credits. However, if you're working with a client and you're unsure of the options they have because of their visa type or immigration status, um, the best option really is to put them into Health Plan Finder and let the system determine their eligibility. You know, that being said, if you think that their eligibility has been incorrectly determined, of course, reach out to me. Um, we'll, I'll happily take a look at um, what you're working with, and we'll see if we can uh, figure out a resolution for them. Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about Washington Apple Health eligibility in particular. So you must be a Washington State resident to be covered by Washington Apple Health. Um, so that can be tough for people to prove, especially if they're new to the state. One of the best ways to prove this is to simply have a Washington State uh, driver's license or ID card. You can get either of those online if you have a current address. If you don't have a current address, you have to go to the Department of Licensing uh, to seek that card. Uh, another really easy way to prove residency is to have a bill for, say, power, or water, or rent that's addressed to you at your current address in Washington State with you. Um, that can help prove that you qualify for Apple Health. Now we're going to take a look at what Health Plan Finder updates are, are really going on this month. Um, so, 
April is going to have FPL changes occur. Now, um, this is important in Health Plan Finder because Health Plan Finder does not automatically recalculate eligibility for enrollees who meet Washington Apple Health eligibility requirements under the new federal poverty level rates. So if a change is reported, however, by a QHP enrollee that makes them eligible for Washington Apple Health, you know, they will be automatically moved over to Washington Apple Health. On a case-by-case -case basis, what I can do is if you have people who We're going we're gonna to take a moment. It looks like we're having a couple of people who don't have the ability to see our screen, so we're going we're gonna to make sure that they can see what's happening. Are we not showing? Can you audience view? Click on that. Play settings. I apologize. It looks like we uh, had the screen in the presenter view. So we're going to continue now uh, um, with our So I also want to let everybody know that Health Plan Finder has been having some issues with April invoice processing. Uh, those invoices will be posted to dashboards as they become available. So if clients are having questions around not seeing their invoice for April, uh, let them know that it is on the way. So I, I did also want to address training needs. Um, please let us know if you have any training or support needs. We're um, happy, always happy to hold trainings. Um, also, if you identify any topics that you like special trainings on, um, let us know, and we can we can work with um, either the exchange or any other partners to make sure that we meet those training needs for you. So, FPL standards also affect um, Washington Apple Health. These standards um, are going to be going into effect in April, 5th, in April 2015, just like the standard FPL standards for Health Plan Finder. However, these, help, these uh, FPL standards are going to take immediate effect. So Health Care Authority is going to be doing an automated recalculation for kids covered under the health insurance program to identify kids who are eligible for reduced premiums or zero premiums. And then I know that we talked about the managed care plan selection for Washington Apple Health. This go live date has been pushed back by the healthcare authority, and it's our understanding that the new system will allow uh, for provider-specific searches by zip code, or for searches by providers accepting new Washington Apple Health um, clients. Yeah, um, we're going to take a moment and uh, look over some questions. So if you have any current questions or have had a question, we're going to go back and try to ad address those. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and use your, your chat box or your question box to submit those now. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have about the new FPL standards or case-by-case um, -case determina redetermination of people who might be newly Apple Health eligible who were previously qualified health plan eligible only or if you have any questions around um, 
dreamers and their ability to access health insurance services. Ooh. Um, we don't currently have a, a plan to develop a, a new FPL chart. Um, our, probably um, what I would suggest is using the, the Kaiser Health Calculator. That's a, a really good general tool. And it's, um, it was something that I believe we incorporated in last month's webinar. However, I can definitely repost the link to that to the CHOICE website. Okay, so it looks like we don't currently have any additional questions, so we're going to go ahead and, and move forward into our outreach materials and um, strategies. So you can see here a really nice <coughs> image, and this is an image taken from the ABCs of Health Insurance. This is a new health literacy publication that is scheduled to be printed and distributed uh, this week, um, so you should look for it. it. Should be coming shortly for you guys. Um, if you'd like to access the document sooner, it's available through knowyourplan.org. Um, I believe it's also posted to the Washington Health Benefit Exchange Navigator website. So this this t publication primarily targets potential qualified health plan enrollees. However, a lot of the information um, can easily apply to people who are enrolled in Washington Apple Health. For example, on the page that we've shown here, the common average cost for procedure would apply both to potential qualified health plan and Washington Apple Health populations. So you can see here cost of you know seeking medical attention for a stroke in Washington State is twenty three thousand forty nine dollars. Apple Health, that would be covered. Um, now, if you had a qualified health plan, your cost would still be significantly reduced based on the out-of-pocket expenses on a plan you select. So it can really show the benefit of actuarial value in a plan, so how much is the plan paying for versus what you're paying out-of-pocket. So sometimes a, a higher premium is more desirable because it makes accessing services easier. So by framing the conversation around relatively common medical expenses, right, we can talk more clearly about it. And so I really encourage you to become familiar with this document. I think it can be helpful in talking to somebody about why they might be, say, more interested in one metal level than another based on maybe some of the information they've told you about what they think their potential future medical expenses could be in, the, say, the coming year. Um, so last month, we really took a broad view of success stories when we reviewed um, how well we'd done reducing the uninsured rate in Washington, specifically in the counties we serve. Um, this month, you know, I wanted to take a little bit more of a, of a micro view on this topic. So I'm sure that many of you can encounter success stories every day, you know, in this line of work. Um, you know, definitely a lot of a lot of reward there. Um, however, you know, I want to take some time to encourage you to share these success stories. Um, I had a really great interaction um, just this week with, or just last week actually, with with Lee Ayers. Um, he is a navigator and program manager at Mason General Hospital in Mason County. And he shared a fantastic story with me um, about a gentleman who came in last year to be enrolled in Apple Health. And at the time, you know, he was, he was homeless and he was having a tough time. Um, but with his insurance enrollment resources, he was able to get help from community resources. And what that allowed him to do was to stabilize his living situation and um, 
just last week he came in and purchased uh, a QHP from Lee just a year ago, you know, being on Apple Health and having no income and uh, let Lee know that because of his access to health insurance that he now had a, a, a stable a stable job also, which was, um, you know, it just it really shows the um, community benefit the, that you are all providing every day. And so I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, definitely, definitely take that time, especially if somebody is excited about their story, um, to encourage them to share it with you um, and with me. Um, there's also the ability for you to share that story with the exchange, um, and that's a link that we'll be posting along with this webinar on the Choice webpage. So, and uh, last but not reach, reach. Last but not least, I wanted to talk about a little bit more about outreach strategies in terms of referring clients to brokers. So as a reminder, the exchange has some good tools that can help us impartially guide clients to brokers with specific plan questions. So maybe a specific covered benefit um, that through the plan summary you're not able to determine if they would have access to or maybe a specific medical condition that you're not 100% certain if the plan carries, uh, this would be a, a reason to refer to a broker. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to the Washington Health Plan Finder website. And I wanted to show you that, that navigation tool. Over. Yeah, this one. Okay. So now if you uh, scroll down the page here, you can see that we can find a broker. And so if you click on that broker link, and then the easiest way to navigate this search a broker link is by the client zip code. So if we say, uh, so we're in, here at Choice, we're over in Olympia. So maybe we want to search by an Olympia zip code for our client. Now we see here that it pulls up a whole bunch of different options. And you can see here that um, we have brokers' addresses, their emails, their phone numbers, uh, all really useful contact information. Now at this point, it's a little intimidating, right? We have 152 brokers who serve the 98501 zip code. Obviously, now it starts to look like it's hard to impartially refer. However, the client may be familiar with a particular location in your city, so maybe they're really comfortable going over to Lily Road. Okay, well that's perfect. It's close for them. You know, part of the reason they came in to see you for health insurance is because they wanted in-person assistance. So it's important to make sure that whoever you're referring them to um, can give them in-person assistance and is really easily accessible. So you know, we can email this this broker, but it would be preferred if you call the broker. So what we want you to do is they say, I want to speak with Jan at GHB, as an example. So what you should do is you should call GHB and set up an appointment with the client right there to speak with Jan at GHB. And once you've done that, now that broker has the ability to call that person and follow up and make sure that they get enrolled in health insurance. So um, I had a fantastic opportunity to listen in to the public, the publicly um, held board meeting, and one of the concerns was that once they leave your office without a health plan, what kind of follow-up are we doing to um, make sure that these people are getting enrolled in the services that they need? So taking this step to follow up with a broker and uh, get that client an appointment card is really important. Um, now that being said, you know, if somebody walks in and they say, I have a pre-existing condition and I want to make sure it's covered by the health plan that I'm going to be enrolled in, you know, definitely at least start that application process with them because they might be Washington Apple Health eligible, you know, or or they might have a, simply have a question about a formulary, and those kinds of um, 
those kinds of tools are available in Health Plan Finder, and they can help you make in, they can help you and the client make um, good decisions about talking about how to shop for a qualified health plan. Okay, so um, with without any further ado, now what we're going to do is we're going to actually have uh, Chris with the exchange. So we're going to have Chris with the exchange uh, talk about qualified health plans. Hey James, have you have you sent me the? Um, there we go. <laughs> Okay, Chris, you should be ready to go now. Okay. Tell me if you can see my 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 screen here. Yeah. See the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So folks, what, what I'm doing this morning is I'm going to present part of a webinar that Dave Chandra presented for us in December of last year. And Dave is a senior policy analyst for the Center on Bu Budget and Policy Procedures. He's also a volunteer certified application counselor. So a couple days a week, he does volunteer his time and help people enroll in health care. So a lot of what he's learned about this procedure has been on when he's volunteering to do this work. So he's in the trenches with you. And I'm going to go ahead and just start it. I, I've keyed it up. I'm going to. He's going to go through. Chris, I'm sorry. Yes. We can see all three of your current screens. How exciting! Okay. Perfect. Okay. okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get this started. He's going to start with a, an um, explanation of some common insurance terms and how insurance the policies are put together, and then go into a couple of examples through the Washington Health Plan Finder. And I'm going to stop him after his second example, and I'm going to provide a third one. He does a third one on his webinar, but he does not use the Health Plan Finder. So I'm going to do the third one through the Health Plan Finder. So let's get him started. And um, James, I need to know, I want to make sure that you can hear this. So if not, please you know, let me know. Okay. It looks, so far, so good. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. All right. So basic elements of insurance and then some key trends that we're seeing that are happening in the marketplaces related to the plans being offered. And then the second part okay, Chris, the we're not actually, browsing, we're only seeing the Washington uh, Health Plan Finder screen. We're not and seeing and the recorded and webinar. And plans that are available. So I'm going to get started. The first thing we're going to do is talk about um, just sort of the elements involved in insurance. And so these are sort of four key parts of insurance whenever you're working with a client to try to decide, you know, how to evaluate them. You have your monthly premium, you have the, all the cost sharing information like deductibles and co-pays, and that's really all the cost sharing is really referred to as the plan design. Then you have the covered benefits. Um, Great, thank you.
you imagine that you have your total medical expenses for the course of a year, which no one predict, no one knows exactly, but let's say you happen to have a high cost year for the course of the year, and this goes throughout the entire calendar year. You have a deductible amount, and let's just pick an example of $1,500. Uh, let's pick an example of an out-of-pocket maximum amount, in this case, $5,500. And so the way I walk it with the client is just saying, you know, if you get any medical bill through the first fourth part of the year, you will have to pay the first $1,500 of any of those bills. You'll have to pay them out of pocket before any insurance benefits kick in, for the most part. Once you've accumulated those bills, now if you go and get any medical care, you and the insurance company split that cost, and you just pay that copay or a co-insurance, and the insurance company picks up the rest of the bill. But once that accumulates, and you'll, you know, if you go into medical care and you pay an additional, in this case, $4,000, that $4,000 plus the initial $1,500 you've already spent during the year equals $5,500. So during the course of the year, if you've hit that amount, you've now hit the out-of-pocket maximum. And the insurance company will pay full amount for all care received, and you don't pay anything. And this is as long as you're going to in-network providers, of course. So let's walk through some of these scalings a little further. So deductibles, just brief overview, because I know many of you have probably already seen other webinars or examples of this stuff. And we have other webinars recorded, including one from last week on the 10th that walks through some of this in greater detail. So for deductibles, you know you'll have uh, an amount for individual and then twice that amount for family. Obviously, if a family has more than two people in it, the deductible stays at that twice amount. So if you have a child or any other dependents, adult dependents or child dependents, the deductible is still twice the individual amount. There's also different deductibles based on whether there's a, a separate prescription drug deductible or if it's included. So in this case, in this particular example of a Molina plan sold in uh, Washington State, there is actually a separate individual uh, drug deductible of two hundred dollars for individuals or four hundred dollars for family. So any bills you get for prescription drugs, they will count towards that drug deductible, and that's a lower amount once you hit it. Then your benefits and services from the insurance company kick in, and you only pay a copay. So for some people, that's beneficial. Maybe if you have a lot of prescription drug needs but don't really have many other needs. But um, for other folks, they might prefer a combined deductible where it's all one amount, and so once you hit it in any one thing, it allows you to then pay the co-insurance for any other service. So in Washington State, the way they describe that combined deductible is using this language here, where it'll say included in annual deductible. So that's one of the places to go check and see whether or not it's a separate drug deductible or included in a combined uh, drug deductible deductible. So another thing is whether if the plan has out-of-network coverage, then you're going to see here that you'll have an, a deductible amount and an out-of-pocket amount the in-network services you get, in this case $2,750 for an individual, and then there'll be a separate amount for any care received out of network. And so all out of network expenses will count towards that separate deductible, which in this case is double, $5,500 for individuals. And you'll notice the out-of-pocket maximum is higher too, it's double in that case. But um, there is no ACA requirement for an out-of-pocket maximum for out of network care. So sometimes you might see that amount there in out-of-pocket for out of network, it might be unlimited or no limit, because that's allowed. So that's, again, another thing. If someone's interested in out-of-network care, it's another important thing just to watch for so they understand the implications of it. Um, another thing that often confuses a lot of us related to family deductibles is whether they're aggregate or embedded. So the aggregate deductible is the one that we're sort of used to seeing. So let's say there's this three-person family and they have a $6,000 deductible. Everyone who goes to the, get medical care gets bills, and all of those bills, when they add up and accumulate the $6,000, then everyone is back to deductible. And now the insurance benefits kick in, and you only pay co-pays or co-insurance. This is in contrast to this other model, the embedded deductible, where there's still a $6,000 deductible for the whole family, but each person has sort of a mini deductible that applies to that. So let's say in this case the child actually gets $2,000 or $3,000 of medical expenses through the course of the year. They've now hit the, the deductible, and anything they do on top of that will now only be co-pays or co-insurance, because the insurance benefits will kick in but the other two family members will still have to pay the full cost of care until they hit their mini deductible. But if any one person or any two people have medical bills that accumulate and they meet not only their mini deductible, but they also meet the whole family's deductible, then everyone has met the deductible, even if one person hasn't received any care at all. I'll admit that I haven't seen many of this embedded deductible model um, out in the marketplaces, uh, but I also know that it's very hard to even tell anywhere on the websites or on the, on the other information provided. So um, it is worth trying to figure out or maybe calling the insurance company if you have a family and they're, they're interested about this information. So I mean, uh, one of the things I know many of you are familiar with is the difference between copay and co-insurance. So copays is just this fixed dollar amount. Here's a plan from coordinated care, a silver plan there that you know you can see for the primary care visit, for the specialty visit, and for emergency room, you pay a flat, a flat fee each time you go as a visit. Um, 
Um, co-insurance, on the other hand, which is another part of this plan, is they actually have a, a percentage of whatever the medical bills are. In this case, for outpatient laboratory services or for outpatient surgery or for hospitalizations. Now, as you probably know, most consumers will ask, well, 25% of what? And unfortunately, we don't have an answer for that because um, the medical you know, costs of coverage, the actual billing amount, is something that's very untransparent and something that's very difficult to know or predict. So most consumers are shy uh, or worried about the co-insurance plans. However, plans that have more co-insurance tend to be cheaper. So you'll probably see those um, on the lower end of the marketplace, you know, price-wise, whatever you're looking. Um, in the similar way that there's in-network and out-of-network out of network deductibles, there's also in-network and out-of-network co-pays. So here at your site for a bridge span plan, a silver plan here in Washington, you can see that if for an in-network provider, there's these amounts for primary care visits, $30 copay, and for hospital admissions, which is 30% after the deductible. And then you have the out-of-network amounts, which is much higher. So it's 50% across the board after the deductible. And in fact, most plans have out-of-network insurance, the co-insurance that's much higher, and many of them actually have it as high as 50%. So that's a common thing that you'll see if someone's looking at a plan that includes out-of-network coverage. Um, another important thing to watch for is the copays for the prescription drugs. So here you can see that there's four tiers of prescription drugs that all plans are selling. Um, of the generic prescription drugs, which have the lowest copay, they'll have brand name prescription drugs that are on list. Uh, so it's called preferred brand name or you know listed brand name. There's a third tier called non-preferred brand name, and some plans don't even cover them. As you can see here, this group health plan doesn't even cover them. And then specialty prescription medications, which is uh, in this case has the highest copay at 20%. Um, you know, another way you'll see them in web uh, websites on insurance companies might be tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. So it's important to get comfortable with that nomenclature because different companies call it in different ways. And then one of the most important things that we've been talking about a lot this year is the concept of some services being exempt from the deductible. So you can see here, here's a deductible for a plan that's sold by Bridge Plan. Bridge Plan's bronze plan is $5,000. And you can see all of these services have the term after deductible, after the amount. So you have to meet the deductible first, and then you pay these co-pays uh, once you've met the deductible. Um, but Several other services here, a handful, actually don't say after deductible, they say before deductible, or they don't say anything at all about the deductible. And so in this case, this means that you actually get this coverage, what they often call first dollar coverage, right away. At the start of the year, you can just pay thirty dollars for the primary care visit, and you can pay thirty dollars for prescription drugs. And so this is a very important thing to flag, especially for people who are very price conscious and they want to buy the cheapest plans. Um, so those are plans that tend to have very high deductibles, and so one of the things you can look for is, well, does this plan at least offer some primary care services without having to meet the deductible? And that's something we definitely recommend looking for um, so that consumers can get some benefit from their coverage, even if it has a high deductible. Um, one of the things that you can, you know, a great useful tool that all plans must provide is this summary benefits and coverage. I'm sure many of you have seen these or used them um, on the Health Plans or Finder site. You have to click at the bottom. There's a link there, and then that'll take you to the actual PDF of each insurance company. Here's an example of the Bridge Plan uh, Health Plan that sold the Exchange Bronze Plan sold in Washington State. And so, you know, the first page gives you information about the deductible, the out-of-pocket max. Uh, you can scroll down to other pages, and as you can see here, it has more details on the primary care visits and specialty visits. Um, it'll often say whether the deductible was waived or not, or what other things have to be met, like if there's a coverage limit. In this case. You can see on the bottom right, for acupuncture surgery, there's a limit of 12 visits per year. Um, it's a five to seven page document, so I have a lot of information and a great tool that's useful to use. So uh, just real quick, we want to show an example of the cost sharing reductions. I know, you know many of you are familiar with the fact that if people are at certain income levels, they get not only a tax credit that helps them with their monthly premium, but also are able to qualify for particular types of silver plans that might be more generous than the regular plans. So this is an example from Pennsylvania at Lancaster, and I just put in the information comparing each version of this one plan. So every similar plan has three variants, and there are three variants that make them slightly more generous. So for anyone who's above 250 percent, they have the base plan, which you can see here. And you can see how the deductible is different. This company has lowered the deductible for the slightly more generous silver plan, the 73 percent plan. And the even more generous plan, the 87 percent plan, they've lowered the deductible more, down to $500. And then they've lowered it even more for the most generous plan in the marketplace, which is the 94% similar plan. And that's eligible for anyone who's under 150% of the property. And you can see there's similar sort of lowering or making more generous that they do for the out-of-pocket maximum, for the primary care visit, they made it more generous. Um, and most plans, this is how they structure their more generous plans, is they will lower certain things and certain costs. 
but you'll notice for prescription drugs it actually didn't change across this particular plan. Um, there might be another product sold by this company or by another company that lowers the prescription drug amounts but doesn't lower the deductible amount as much. So each company is sort of able to decide how they want to vary and make more generous the variance of this open plan. Um, and all of you know, all the plans must offer the TED essential health benefits. Um, and so for the most part, this means that all plans are covering uh, roughly the same thing. There will be some variation of prescription drugs and maybe tiny amounts for some other things like this. But for the most part, most plans are covering similar things. And that's useful to know. It takes that sort of off the table something you have to worry about. But there are some variations in something called other covered services. So this is a, one of the last pages of the summary of benefits and coverage. And this is an example for the Bridgespan Health Company, the bronze plan we were looking at before. It shows you here that even though acupuncture and chiropractic care are not part of the essential health benefits, they are covered by this plan, so they allow you to get that. Um, and, and different companies might have different things that they offer here. So it's worth looking at just to get a sense if there's any variation that might matter to someone. Um, but the provider network is obviously one of the most important things related to each company. Uh, this is the doctors and pharmacies and hospitals that are in network for them. So this is the group health plan that's sold in Washington. And you can click on the provider site and that lists all the providers and doctors relative to a given zip code. Um, obviously, um, it's very important to know the differences between each insurance company, but often each insurance company has different networks among their own products, and so they might have different names for them, so it's important to try to get familiar with that, a select network or a limited network or a partner network or something like that, um, to, to get comfortable with which ones are sort of very narrow and which ones have a lot of providers. Um, the terms you see on the screen now, um, for some of you are familiar with, just from having insurance in the past, but certainly with the marketplace, um, the differences between the PPO and the HMO, um, PPOs are obviously the ones that are, tend to be most expensive and they allow out-of-network coverage. And point-of-service plans are also uh, allow out-of-network coverage, but they might be slightly less flexible than PPOs. They might require you to have a PCP, a private care provider, or require you to have referrals. The HMO is um, the plan that uh, many of us are also familiar with, where there's no out-of-network coverage whatsoever except for emergency care, which is required by the law. And it may probably requires you to have a designated primary care provider and get referrals and all that. More recently, there's something called an EPO, an Exclusive Provider Organization, which is something that doesn't have out-of-network coverage, uh, but maybe it, lets you, it doesn't require you to have a PCP or require you to have referrals. So they kind of refer to an EPO as like a PPO model of letting you do whatever you want, but just it has to be a network that's not the network. I think in practice, the EPOs are actually looking like they're, they're even more uh, limiting than an HMO. So you'll often see an EPO where they describe the networks, not just by like the area or like a number of doctors or which network, um, which hospital networks, but they'll actually describe it by a geographic region. They might say like a particular county or two counties. And so I would think EPOs tend to be on the cheaper end of the market, but tend to have the, the least amount of provider access. And so that's something just important to watch for. And then lastly on the front end is just talking about the prescription drug formulary. Every plan has to have a list of drugs that's covered. And this is just an example for this group of plan. It's a PDF, and you pull it up, and you have to scroll through it. Um, other plans have it as like a searchable site where you can type the name of the uh, drug, and it will tell you sort of how much, you know, what tier it's in, if it's a generic or a brand, and what the copay might be. Um, so now I just want to go into the trends that we're seeing in marketplace plans, and these are trends that are both from 2013 into 2014 when we were seeing marketplace plan coverage, but also from last year to this coming year. So one of the first things we're seeing is that you're seeing a lot more plans have a lot more co-insurance instead of co-pays. This is because insurance companies really want to try to get the most competitive price and really be among one of the bottom two or three prices in a given, uh, you know, a given silver range or a given bronze range. Because we know consumers are very price sensitive. So one of the ways they can make that plan cheaper is having more things have co-insurance because that puts more of the cost on the consumer. So you can see this is a particular rich plan, um, exchange silver plan, one of the cheaper plans in the silver range. And it has all coinsurance. It's all 20% coinsurance after you hit the deductible. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye out, especially for consumers who are nervous about coinsurance. And you might want to make sure we talk to them about um, looking at plants that might have some copay options instead. And uh, another thing to talk about is we talk about the four tiers of prescription drugs. Well, it turns out there's actually more tiers. So some companies, this is an example in Austin, Texas, not in Washington. Some companies are actually having a preferred list for generics and a non-preferred list for generics. And so in this case, they're, they're saying it's a $10 copay for the preferred generic list, and it's doubled at about $20 for the non-preferred generic. And some plans will even split the specialty level up into preferred and non-preferred. So instead of having four tiers, you may see as many as six tiers. And you may not necessarily see that on the Washington Health Planner site, because it's built in to have just the four levels. 
So you might have to go into the summary of benefits and cover its facts to get that information. One of the things that's very frustrating is that if you're looking at a particular drug, it might say level two or tier two on a given insurance company's website. Well, that tier two might be non-preferred generic, like in this example on the screen, or it might be the preferred brand if it's a different insurance company and they don't have a non-preferred generic category. So even though it's called tier two in two different companies, it might mean drastically different things and it might mean drastically different copay amounts. So just an additional thing for us to keep track of. Um, another thing we're seeing more commonly, especially this year, is this concept of a three-step copay. And that's not really an industry standard term, it's something that I'm using for this. It's this concept of you may have a high deductible, in this case the deductible is $5,250, but they're allowing you to go to the primary care physician for a copay amount of $30 for the first four visits. After the first four visits, any additional visits are actually subject to the deductible, so you pay the whole amount, and then after you hit the deductible, you then pay 35% co insurance. So there's sort of three different amounts that you're paying for primary care through the course of the year. So it's sort of these three different options. Um, it's, it might be a very good option for people who might have to buy a, you know, a product that's as cheap as possible because they're tight on cash. But even though it has a high deductible, at least they want some access to primary care on the front end. So that's an important thing to keep track of. Um, on a similar vein is this concept of understanding the difference between plans that are HSA eligible versus non-HSA eligible. So HSA stands for health savings account, and that's an account that sort of allows you to have some tax benefit in putting money into an account pre-tax that you can then use to pay for medical expenses as long as it's used to a high deductible plan that you buy. Um, so some people I know, contractors and others who are self-employed, buy high deductible plans, put a lot of money in these accounts, they get pre-tax benefits, and even though they're paying for all the costs out of pocket because they have a really high deductible, they're at least getting that sort of tax break of it. And when the money isn't used at the end of the year, they can roll it over to the next year. Well, we know most of the families we work with don't have a lot of cash lying around to put in an HSA account. And so the HSA plans actually don't benefit the kind of families we work with, especially if they're lower income. And so one of the most important things to note, though, is that an HSA plan actually prohibits you, prohibits the insurance company, from having any services exempt from the deductible, um, except for uh, preventive services, which is required by law. So as you can see here, the difference between these two very similar Kaiser plans sold in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I volunteer, and the one on the left, they're the same exact plan, except the one on the right is non-HSA and it costs a little more, and the one on the right exempts the primary care and specialty visit, whereas the one on the left, the HSA plan, is not allowed to, so it requires you to be deductible first. And the same is true for the routine eye exam for kids and for generic prescription drugs. So I often, when working with clients, try to look for plans that don't have the term HSA in the name, unless someone really wants that or they really, really are price sensitive and just want to buy the cheapest product, I might try to scroll down and look for plans that are non-HSA eligible because that means they may give them some access to services without the deductible being applied. So that's that first dollar coverage thing we talked about before. Um, another important thing that I know has been brought up uh, many times, including in Washington State, is the fact that insurance companies selling in the marketplace have actually really done a lot to restrict the number of providers that you're eligible to see. So they've created so-called narrow networks. Uh, there's a lot of debate around whether narrow networks are good or whether they're bad. I think most people would agree that a quote-unquote narrow network, which allows the insurance company to kind of charge you less or give you a cheaper product, it might be okay for someone as long as that person can still find the number of providers that they need. But it's not okay for someone who might have a hard time finding an adequate number of providers. And so if it's an inadequate network, that's a problem. I know in Washington State, your insurance commissioner has put in some regs to really push the insurance plan sold in the marketplace to really uh, try to meet some better standards when it comes to having adequate provider numbers available to consumers. So that's certainly something to watch over the course of the next few years. Um, some, some things that insurance companies are doing is not just necessarily narrowing their network, but tiering their network. So this is an example in, uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where a Blue Cross plan has three tiers of networks. And if you go to the preferred tier, then the copays are very low. If you go to the middle tier, then the copays are a little higher. And if you go to the highest tier, then the copays are very high. And just an example, here's the summary of benefits and coverage for that plan. And you can see here, for primary care, it's $25 per visit for the Tier 1 preferred list. And it's a little higher amount if you go to Tier 2 or Tier 3. But you can really see the difference when you look at the outpatient surgery or you look at the hospitalization. So for surgery, the facility fee is $250 if you go to a Tier 1 preferred surgical center. But if you go to Tier 2 or Tier 3, not only is the copay higher, but now it's actually subject to the deductible. So it would, deductibles waived if you go to Tier 1, but you're probably paying a whole lot of amount if you're going to Tier 2 or Tier 3. So another thing that we'll have to do is when we're helping a consumer find out is your provider in network or not, you may also have to take that extra step to find out, well, what tier are they in network? Because if they're Tier 3, then that might be not even useful because then you might be end up paying so much money to go see them. Um, another thing that's been really a problem 
problematic is if you go to a provider directory, this is an example from kansashealthcare.gov, you can click on the provider directory link. Um, I know Washington Health Plan Fiber doesn't have this feature, so it's not as relevant for you all. But one of the things you'll be having a hard time doing is you have to find this plan name or their network name on the website for the insurance company. And then when it's listed on healthcare.gov or on your insurance plan site, you know, on their rear exchange site, might not always be the same the way that it's listed on the insurance company site. That can drive you really crazy because you're not sure then if you're actually looking up the right network when you type in a provider's name for a consumer and see if they're, yes, they're in network or no, they're not. So that's another thing we're hoping can become a little more standardized and something for us to keep watch for. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to, before we pause for questions uh, on the first part, I just wanted to show you this uh, website. Um, the link is in the bottom right corner. It's from this site called ProPublica, which is a journalist website, where they've taken every plan and all the details sold in 2014 and all the plans that are now being sold for 2015, and they have a way where you can go on this site, you'll put in your county and your state, and you can pick on a plan from this current year and see how it's changed for 2015. So this example here from this plan sold in Texas shows the price has gone up, so they have that in red, but some of the copies have gone down, and they have that in green. So for many insurance companies, they might have um, made no changes whatsoever to the plan. So nothing, no change to the, the deductible or the copays, just maybe a price change, up or down. Some plans, they might have changed, like this one, where they changed the price, but also there's some slight tinkering with some of the details. And then other companies have actually completely canceled the products they sold this year, and they're selling a whole new line of products. And so they all either won't even line up on this site, or it'll show a dramatic change all across the board of deductibles, copays, et cetera. But it's useful for you, because you may have clients coming in that currently have coverage from this year, who want to get a sense of, well, how did it change from next year, and maybe there's a better plan that might be my need. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it back over to my colleagues to see if we have any questions before we move on to the, the plan selection process. Thanks, Dave. Yes, we sure do have some questions. Uh, let's see the first one. So in-network providers charge a lower total amount than they do for uninsured patients. So when someone has not met their deductible, can they still pay a lower amount than someone who is uninsured because of an in-network contract? Yeah, that's a great point. So um, when you go to a provider that's in-network, even if you're still needing to meet your deductible, you pay the contractually negotiated rate between the provider and the um, insurance company. That's a, and that's an important thing to note. So let's say the doctor charges $150. That's their so-called list price or charges, but their actual contracted price is $80. So that's what the insurance company would pay them $80, or the insurance company would pay them $80 minus the copay that you would pay if you were you know, at the copay stage. If you're at the deductible stage, you pay the $80, and that goes towards your deductible. Um, and then when you've got the deductible, again, you just pay the copay amount. But it is a good point that for insured people, they actually not only have the benefit of having insurance, they also often have the benefit of paying a lower amount out of pocket, even when they pay the full cost. And certainly for insured patients, that's an unfortunate thing, but it's, it's sort of how things are. Great. Okay. And just so we know, about how long do we have for questions right now? We can take maybe five minutes or so, five, six minutes. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so next question. Some of the plans have the same amount for the deductible and the out-of-pocket. So that means if the deductible is $1,000 and the out-of-pocket is also $1,000, they're asking once the client meets the $1,000 deductible, then is the out-of-pocket also met? Yes, that's a great question. We're actually going to see some examples of that. Um, it, it, we're unlikely going to see plans that have $1,000 deductibles and out-of-pocket maxes unless you're at a cost-sharing reduction level. So you're more likely to see plans in the bronze where they have a deductible of 6000 and an out-of-pocket of 6000 And basically you'll see, in a, in a moment we're going to see those plans will say no charge after deductible for almost every service. Um, or it'll say 0% or $0 after deductible. And that means basically it's like a catastrophic plan. It's like auto insurance where you pay the first amount and then they, they pick up everything after that. Um, a lot of bronze plans look like that, especially the HSA plans. So those are ones that I'd almost argue are like catastrophic plans that unless someone is just, you know, in desperate need to buy the cheapest product, it really means that, that person's on the hook for almost all of their medical services unless and until they have a catastrophic event, a major hospitalization or something. So those don't seem like they're great plans for families who think they might need a lot of care during the course of the year, and it is important to watch out for that. Okay. Okay, so next question is, uh, can you basically explain the difference between a preferred network and in-network? So that's something unique to Washington State, and I have to admit that I'm not 100% familiar, but what, I am, what I'm guessing is the case is, I mentioned that tiered network thing that's happening in many states, um, and so in many states they might have two tiers, in some states they might have three tiers, um, it depends on what the insurance company has decided to do. Um, it looks like Washington Health Plan Finder in the basic template, we're going to look at that shortly when we go through the plan selection, that they've created the template 
template to allow a plan to have a preferred network of providers, an other in-network list, non-preferred or whatever you want to call it, tier two, and then an out-of-network list. I have yet to see a plan where there's any difference between the preferred and the in-network list, um, but maybe I just haven't seen a plan that's doing that in your state, or maybe they haven't done it yet, but maybe next year they might. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so next question. Uh, for services that say co-insurance amount and nothing in the notes section, are those services also subject to a deductible? So that is a, um, a unfortunately all I can say is maybe. And it's one of the most frustrating things I've seen in looking at all of the states and all the exchange uh, sites, healthcare.gov, summary benefits, is there's not been a complete consistency in listing whether or not the deductible applies or not. And that's one of the things I certainly hope every state tries to make a, a concerted effort to make uniform pretty soon. Um, you might see the following. If the deductible does not apply, you might see it say $10 copay before deductible or 10% co-insurance before deductible. You might say just $10 copay and nothing else. But everything else below it, you know, for other services, they might say 40% co-insurance after deductible. So you can assume, because it doesn't say after deductible, that it must mean before deductible. It might say deductible waived. It might say deductible does not apply. So there's a lot of different ways that they describe it. One of the hardest things that I've seen is, and this is more on healthcare.gov, uh, is any time it's a co-pay amount, they won't necessarily say after deductible. If it's co-insurance, it'll always say 40% co-insurance after deductible. But there might be a $10 co-pay for primary care, there might be a $50 copay for specialty care, and neither of those two lines say the words after deductible, but when you go into summary benefits and coverage, you find out that primary care is, in fact, waived from the deductible, but the specialty copay is not waived from the deductible. So there's not consistency. It usually takes you digging at least one extra step, and sometimes the, special, the summary benefits and coverage is even clear, so sometimes you have to go to another step. Um, plans sometimes have a plan brochure on their website you can find, or you may have to call them. And then I apologize because it's super frustrating, but I can empathize entirely. Um, it's not consistent, but um, usually the ones that will be exempt are primary care and generic drugs. So they're more often likely. If you see anything else that looks exempt, it's probably worth double checking just to make sure. Okay, great. So the next question, you may have already answered this and that, but they're asking, is preventative care subject to co-insurance when there is no copay for the visit? Right, so any preventive services are by law required to not have any deductible or any copay, so they're completely free. The, the details, though, are what counts as preventive, and I know many things seem obvious, but sometimes there's been some question as, if you go for a preventive visit and you have certain things checked in the lab, that's fine, but what if you also get another test that's not part of preventive, that's something else, and does that copay kick in or deductible, and, and it is confusing for consumers, I think, for providers, too, so it isn't always the case, but I think, in general, there should be no deductible and no copay applied for any preventive care services. Okay. So let me take one more question, then we'll move on and we can take questions again at the end. Sure thing. Okay. So next question, uh, last one for now, is if a client has a silver plan and they are 150% the federal poverty level or less, um, how does the HSA plan work with the lower out-of-pocket cost since the OOP cost and deductibles aren't as high? Yeah, I don't think they'd be eligible for HSA anymore. So there's requirements by federal tax law of what counts as a quote-unquote high deductible plan. Um, the one thing to remember with the CSR plans for silvers is that unlike the tax credit, which is like it's giving you money to buy insurance, so it just, you know, it's cash that goes to the insurance company and they lower the price for you, the cost sharing reductions go to the insurance company to make them give you a more generous plan for the price of the regular silver plan. So it's almost like baked in the insurance. So when you see the CSR silver plan, that's the most generous version, the 94% AV version, it is a silver, it's not even a silver plan anymore. It's more generous than platinum. So um, it's really not, it's not going to be eligible for HSA anymore. And then, you know, the fact that they call it silver is just the way that they decided to call it in law. I view it as the person that's now gained access to, you know, certain really good silver version plans have been unlocked for them that wouldn't be available if they had a higher income. And so um, it does add some confusion because the name doesn't change and the name HSA might be in there and all this stuff. But it shouldn't any, any longer be eligible for HSA because it needs to have a, a deductible that's higher than a certain amount. Okay, great. Okay. James, I just paused it. I'm I'm sorry. I'm looking at the time and wondering if you want me to go on from here or is this something we should pick up next month? Yeah, if you if you want to go ahead and continue with the webinar, um, that's fine. I definitely understand if um, people aren't going to be available 
um, past the noon hour. Um, we will have this recorded webinar posted, so if you need to sign off the call at noon, totally understandable. Um, however, if any of you have any questions, um, maybe we could do that first, and then we could go into the second part of your webinar, Chris. Sure. Okay. Um, and um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, um, obviously we're still having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, I do appreciate everybody who did call in, and um, we'll make sure that this is not an issue for next time. So we'll go ahead and um, take questions. I do have a couple here already. Um, some of them were answered, but we're going to go over them again really quickly to make sure that they are clear. So one of the questions that wasn't particularly answered in, in this piece, which is a good question, which is how do we know if a particular healthcare provider is affiliated with an insurance company? So in the Health Plan Finder, we have that screen that shows you all the, all the qualified health plans, and there's a search for provider option in each qualified health plan's um, screen. So what you can do is you can click that box and search for your healthcare provider that way. I know it's definitely also recommended that if a client has a question about whether or not a particular provider is inside the network, that they call that provider's office directly to verify if that's the case or not. James, can I add to that? Yes, please do, Chris. One of the things they'll need to be very clear when they call the doctor's office, first of all, I would ask for the billing office, not the front desk. And second of all, they need to be very clear about which plan they're looking at. Some of the carriers have more than one plan available. So they have to be specific to the plan that they're looking at. Not all providers are in all plans of one carrier. Great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. That is very important. Um, then there's another question here, um, and I think that this one might have been answered. How much would a client pay after the insurance covers their portion of the services? So. That can depend. You know, we saw that it can depend on the type of service that they're seeking, whether or not it's specialty care um, or a general office visit. And then if it is a, a preventative service, then it is 100% covered. Um, and then it also depends on whether or not they have copay or coinsurance. Um, and then that goes really nicely with this next question is, um, you know, how much do particular types of services cost, and I think that the, the webinar piece that you shared with us, Chris, goes really nicely into detail on that, and mm -hmm. the answer is that insurers negotiate prices with uh, health care providers, so that means that the list price of a product could be different than the insurance billing price, and the insurance billing price is what's going to do to determine your copay or coinsurance amount, and also whether or not you needed to or have met your deductible. We also have a question um, about dental and vision plans for adults through Washington Health Plan Finder. Washington Health Plan Finder does not currently offer any combined Medicaid or standalone dental plans. However, um, I know that the exchange is looking into offering some of these services at least to the Washington Apple Health population um, in the relatively near future. So, and then again, and then also again, the uh, formularies are included in the plan summary of benefits. They are not included as a hyperlink, but the web addresses are available, and definitely encourage you if you have clients who are interested in knowing about what types of drugs are covered and what their costs are to um, go into those formularies with them and take a look at those associated costs. Okay, it doesn't look like we have um, any other questions at this time, Chris, so if you wanted to go into the next portion of your uh, webinar presentation, that would be great. Okay, thanks, James. Well, let's keep going. So now we're going to focus on um, actually walking through a couple examples of assisting people in selecting a plan. 
So um, first two examples are going to be um, using Washington State and your actual uh, Help Plan Finder website. So the basis for this is going to be this tool that's on the screen right now, which is our Marketplace Plan Comparison Worksheet. It's something we developed, and, and that was actually largely influenced from my experience working with consumers out in Virginia, um, trying to compare plans side by side using the internet, realizing that the sites aren't always great at lining up everything a consumer wants to see, including things like whether a doctor's in network or not, or other things. So we developed this handout, and it's available on our, our website there. And um, we're going to use that as the basis of going through a couple of case examples. So let's go start with Sasha, who's from Vancouver, Washington, who's 37 years old and makes an income of $30,000 a year. So that puts her at 250%, 257% of the federal poverty level, so she's not going to be eligible for cautionary reductions because she's just above that uh, cutoff. So we're actually going to go to Washington Health Plan Finder. This is your site. So we're going to use the Shop for Health Plan function. And we're going to put in some information about her and see what plans come up. So we'll put in her zip code. It shows that she's in Clark County. Um, on other sites, they ask for just the age. In this case, it's asking for first date. So I had the back date, and I just picked everyone as a uh, Four on 12 one, but I just put the appropriate year to make sure that we know that she's 30, uh, 37 years old, and then it asks for the household income, so we'll put $30,000 a year, and we'll see what comes up. My site's been running a little slow, so bear with me here, but um, it'll pull up, and it'll show us the plans that she's available, uh, that are available for her, as well as her tax credit, the price of the plans, and we're going to go through and do some comparison shopping uh, to kind of see how we might walk through this particular case example. So here it shows us in the top right corner that she's eligible for a tax credit of $66.25. And so we might go back to our form here, and we're just going to put in some basic information about her. So the number of people that are going to be in this plan, the tax credit amount of $66.25, and the fact that she's not eligible for any cautionary reduction plan. So here's the rest of the sheet, and we're going to go back to the website and fill some of this information out. So, the first thing we might do for someone like her who might think that she's relatively healthy, um, you know, makes a decent amount of money, but wants to try to find a very affordable plan, we can see the cheapest plan here is this bridge plan, bridge span plan, which is an HSA plan. It's $138. So we might um, have the health plan finder has a great option where you're able to compare uh, a couple plans side by side. So I'm going to click on that and do that. Um, we can look at some other plans. Let's see if there's any plan that doesn't have a high deductible or at least includes some coverage before the deductible. So one of the ways to look at it is look in this right-hand column here, where it says 50% coinsurance after deductible. And let's keep looking if it looks like anything has any plan that is uh, pre-deductible coverage. Um, in the first five, it doesn't look like it. So I'm going to add, uh, we're going to put 20 on a page and see what comes up. And so if we scroll down, eventually we get to this Moda plan, which is $166 a month. So certainly a lot more money, $100 more. But it looks like it allows a $30 copay for some amount of primary care visits. So this is likely that three-step copay option that I mentioned earlier. We can look at some more information about this one. Um, and it does look like it allows you for the first four visits to get a $30 copay instead of uh, wait, pay, waiting for deductible. So we might include this Moda one. Let's include Moda. This one right here. And then one of the other things we can think about is, well, she's definitely worried about price, you know, maybe a silver plan in case she's really not happy with the high deductibles of these plans. Let's go ahead and just look at what the cheapest silver plan might be to see. Uh -oh. Looks like we should go back and put her in front of it again. And while well, unfortunately that to deal with glitches and errors, um, one of the things in some previous webinars uh, that was brought up to me from some colleagues on the line was that when folks are working with consumers, you'll come up with a couple glitches and errors from these sites. So I guess we're just doing it truly in real-time fashion. So we'll go ahead and add these two plans again. Here's the Moda. And then we'll go to Silver and see what Silver plans come up. Uh oh. Well, this is not occurring earlier this morning, so I don't know if any of my colleagues from the Health Plan Finder might be able to weigh in and see if there's a way we can work around this. We are, it, it's really good, unfortunately. So if you want to try it one more time and if it doesn't work, uh, you know, that's, that's all we can really say. There's no real workaround or anything. Sorry about this, you guys. Sure. Um, I have the information on the on the, the slide, so we can just um, you want to trust my judgment on what the cheap 
So in this case, we're going to say they suggest that actually because of their current health needs, they are interested in seeing how these plans differ on the laboratory services co-pays and on x-rays and diagnostic images. So we'll take that into account now when we go and look. So um, one of the things you'll notice is that because they're eligible for the CSR level, the several plans tend to be very important, to, uh, might be important things to show them. And Washington Health Plan Finder actually defaults you to go to look at the several plans right away. It doesn't even show you the bronze. Um, Healthcare.gov doesn't do that. It always goes to the cheapest plan. If you did go to the bronze, what you'd see is that they actually are eligible for plans that are free. Their tax credit is so large that they're eligible for a bunch of these bronze plans at very low cost. In fact, many of them are free. But they have very huge deductibles, 13,000, 12,000 dollar deductibles. So it would probably be great for us to actually look at the several plans. Um, and it's one of the good things that uh, your site actually sort of starts you there. So here you can look at some of these several plans. Here's one that's $27. It looks pretty generous. It has a $1,000 family deductible. We'll look at that one. Um, here's another one from a different company from Bridgespan of $78. We'll look at that one. And then they might say that they uh, maybe they had insurance in the past, or maybe they have some providers that are only in certain networks. And so let's just say in this case, Anne says that her doctor, her OBGYN actually is, uh, you know, that it takes Primera Blue Cross, and that's a plan she used to have from her old job, but uh, currently doesn't have it. And so she might say, can you just show us what the cheapest Primera one is, in case they want to go back to that kind of plan. So we can go and look, and so you can see we looked at plans that were 27 and $78, and we're looking to see where the Primera one is. And in this particular market in Seattle, the Primera plan, the cheapest one, is actually this $174 one. It's much more expensive. But they might be interested in it, so we can go ahead and add that, just so we can compare the three. So let's view the comparisons. So this lets you side, put side by side these three plans. You can see the difference in price. So much, you know, much variation across price. You can see the difference in deductible, $1,000, $400, or $500. So the more expensive plans have much lower deductibles. You can see the difference in their primary care visits. The cheapest plan actually have a $1 copay for primary care and a $5 copay for specialist. And it's a little more expensive for these higher price plans. And there's more information here about um, generic drugs and brand name drugs. Um, they were interested in lab services, so outpatient labs and x-rays are right here. So we can take all of this information and go ahead and put this on our form. And so this is the first one, the coordinated care plan that's pretty cheap. Um, it looks like it actually exempts the deductible from several uh, primary care services and generic drugs. Here's another one, which is Bridgespan, where nothing is exempt from the deductible, but it's only $400, so it's a lot lower. And then here's another the Primera Blue Cross plan that they wanted you to look at uh, that has a $500 deductible and, again, doesn't exempt anything, and then it's all coinsurance after that. So there's pros and cons to all these plans. But one of the things you might want to be uh, ask them about is, do they have anything else that they're interested in? So they mentioned that Anne has an OBGYN, so this is an actual OBGYN that was provided to me from the staff in Washington. Uh, so it's an OBGYN in Seattle. Uh, maybe James mentions that he recently had a diagnosis of something that might be cancerous, and so is very interested in possibly seeing an oncologist because he's worried about that. So maybe one of the things he wants to know is how many oncologists are nearby in each plan. And then maybe James also mentions that he happens to have uh, type 2 diabetes, and he takes a commonly used drug metformin for that drug, uh, for that condition. So this is something that you can actually help them look up and compare the plans across. And right now, the websites of most marketplaces aren't so good at integrating this information, and that's why we're doing it by hand. So let's go back to the lab and first do this. Um, as I mentioned before, your site doesn't allow you to click on a link to the provider directory, so it's something we have to do manually. So we'll go ahead onto the website and we're going to do it. We'll start with coordinated care. And we're going to actually look up for this provider to see if they're a network or not. So we're going to I'll take you back there and look again. Coordinated care offers Medicaid plans for you guys in Washington, but also health insurance marketplace. So we'll click on the Ambetter version. We'll click on Find a Provider, and it'll ask us to put in a zip code. So we're going to go ahead and put in their zip code. And then it's asking us for the provider name, so we can go ahead and put that in. And we'll search. And so in this case, it turned out that no provider was found. So it looks like for this particular insurance company, this provider's not a network. Let's go ahead and do the same search for bridge spans. So for rich span, um, each site is going to be different, so it takes some getting used to. So in this case, I found that it's you go to customer service, and you go find a doctor. And here it asks you to search by name or location, so we'll go ahead and put the name in of the provider. I'll put the zip code in here. And search. And here it shows that she actually does come up. 
and OBGYN is accepting new patients. So we can take this information, we can do it for Premier Blue Cross as well, and I actually did that separately, and we can come here and we can mark this down on the form. So it turns out that this provider is not in network for coordinated care, but is in network for Bridgespan and for Primera. We can do the same type of search for the oncologist. So we can actually go back to the web, go to the Embedder site, let's delete the name of the provider, and in this sentence, instead of putting the provider name in, we'll try to select the type of provider. We'll do specialist, we'll select the type of specialty, in this case, oncologist, so hematology and oncology, and we'll search. And so it will now do a search for all of the hematologists and oncologists in the given area near the zip code. So some sites will say 20 results within 10 miles or, or let you change the radius. This particular insurance company doesn't. So I actually had to scroll through and count the number of providers that are within 10 miles. I found out that there's 14. And we can go back and do the same for Bridgespan. You can do it for Primera. And we'll go on the form and we'll record that result as well. So coordinated care has 14 within 10 miles. Bridgespan has 62. And Primera has 110 oncologists within 10 miles. And then lastly, let's look up the prescription drug. So in this case, let's go back to the lab. Let's actually look it up on the Primera site. So here, they have it where you look in the pharmacy section. You look up Rx search. And so some sites, it'll be a PDF. They'll have to search the PDF. Other sites, it's this online tool. So we can go here to list the name, brand the generic. Type in metformin, and it comes up. So we see it's covered, and this number here indicates that it's covered in Tier 1. If I click on one of these, it'll show you it's Tier 1. And Tier 1 means it's the lowest cost generic drug. So we can, again, take this information. We can do the same search for the other three plans, come back, and put that in here. And it turns out for these particular plans, the metformin is covered as a generic for all three of the plans. So whatever the generic copay is is what it will be. So now we have a lot of information about these three plans. Um, and tailored to this particular family, and they can now try to decide which of these might make the most sense. So for them, we're going to talk through the priorities, which are the same that we went through with Sasha, but maybe there might be some additional ones, including if they have any current providers, are they in network or not, what's the size of the network, or size of the network for various specialties like oncology, and if their prescription drugs are covered or not. So we're going to go through one last example now, and unfortunately I wasn't able to do this example using Washington data because there were some Okay, so this is where I went ahead and did um, did this for using the, the data that he brings up next, and I did go ahead and put it into the health plan finder. I'm in the wrong place here. Hope you're not getting seasick from my going back and forth there. Okay, so shop for a health plan. So his next example, I'm going to go ahead and scroll this up. You're going to hear him for just a second because I'm going to bring it up. The courts in the health plan site that didn't allow me to use this particular family. Come on. All right. So this is his example. It's a family of five where they have uh, a uh, husband and wife, three children. The oldest one is, I believe she's 21. Um, however, she is a de she's a dependent. She is receiving more than half of her support from her parents. So we're going to add her to this as well. Now, if you'll see here where it shows that they're at 161% federal poverty level. So their income is 45000 One thing I wanted to do is show you how they came up with 161% of the federal poverty level so, so that you know. And you, you may already know. But if I look at, for a family of five, now I went to a chart that was in the Qualified Health Plan webinar that's pre-recorded and on the training site. And I noticed that for a family of five, 100% of the federal poverty level is $23,850. So this family makes $45,000. If you take the $45,000, divide it by the $23,850, that's the 100% of the federal poverty level, and then multiply it by 100, you come up with 161%. So just real quick so that you can see 
This family makes $45,000. 100% of the federal poverty level is $23,850. When you do the math there, let's see, the answer, of course, I didn't, is, where did I, it's 16 something, but let's do this. 45,000 divided by 23,850, it's 1.8867 and something's not right. 45, 23,850. Because I came up with the same thing he did. Anyway, that's the, that's the idea. If you take the amount they make, divide it by the amount of the federal pop uh, for five at 100% of the federal poverty level, and then multiply that end number by 100, it comes up to 161%. So I'm going to move this to the side and oops, this is what I want. Let's get started. So what I did was I chose a 98502 zip code, which puts us in Thurston, oops, there's a choice here. I put it in Thurston County. Now this is going to take a little bit of time. Um, date of birth, let's see, 1201, 19, 1971, male, and let's see, how much did he make? He makes 20,000, annually, we're going to add his wife, let's see, I chose the same date of birth, they're the same age, and that's for him. She's his spouse. She makes twenty-five thousand annually. Hope I didn't forget anything. Okay, household member number two is one of the one of the children and twelve one nineteen ninety-four and she's female. She is a dependent. The next household member is 16. Her date of birth, 1999. Oh. Another dependent. And the last one, get over there. And show plan. Oh. Okay. And I have pre populated three plans. So what if you'll notice there's something that I did incorrect because this should come up correctly and and it has something to do with how I put the information in. I'm not going to go back just because of time. Um, but so if you take a notice up here, what I've done, their tax credit's 517.38 a month. There's five people. The two youngest daughters were Washington Apple Health eligible. So they are not part of this. This is you know, they'll go into Washington Apple Health. So what they this family needs to do is choose a plan for those three people. And I chose an Ambedder Silver, a Bridge Span Silver, and then an Ambedder Bronze. And they're not in order. He was very nice and put them in order of lowest to highest. So I went mid, high, and then the, the lowest for premium after tax credits. They also do get some cost sharing reductions. So here, if you look down here, the the mid the mid range plan the deductible fifteen hundred per person or three thousand per family the one that's a little more expensive is five hundred per person and a thousand dollars for two or more 
and then the low one, the bronze level one, has the highest deductible. So again, it's back to what, what the presenter before was saying. It really does depend on what this family is looking for and what can they afford on a monthly basis. Um, and then um, the bridge or the, the lowest one also had those first three visits uh, are free before the 40% coinsurance after they meet their deductible. So, you know, this is something a family would have to weigh out. And it, again, it depends. As one of the people, do they need uh, do they need a specialist? Do they not need a specialist? Are they looking at needing some kind of an outpatient procedure um, in a hospital? Um, sometime during the year, I will tell you, just this last January, I had back surgery. Had I not had insurance, the entire bill was over $40,000, and I did spend one night in the hospital. And, you know, fortunately, I have insurance, and my I have met my total out-of-pocket expense already this year. So that, you know, good for me. Um, but these medical care is not cheap. So, you know, a family does need to take a look and decide what, what can they afford and what's going to be important for them. Now, so you know, this form is, um, I think James is going to post it. It's also posted on the training page for, for navigators, and it's posted where the recorded webinars are. Um, so it's in the area where this, the webinar that I just showed you is located. James, do you want me to go into anything else? Uh, no, that's fantastic. If anybody will take any additional questions that anybody may have uh, currently. Sure. Um, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Great. Okay, Chris, well, it doesn't look like we, um, we have any additional questions currently. So um, I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for being on the webinar today. I know we ran a little long, so I appreciate it that you were able to stick with us. You know, um, for those people who were not able to stick with us, obviously this webinar will be posted on the CHOICE website, so anything you missed and you might want to catch up on will be available there. Um, we are always looking um, for feedback on our webinar to improve the experience and make sure that we are always addressing your most relevant um, concerns or queries around Health Plan Finder um, or um, even Washington Apple Health, for that matter. So definitely direct the feedback and any questions or any future webinar interest you may have to me. Um, also, we uh, did make an effort to respond to the survey answers and the webinar. It was, because of that, held on a Wednesday morning. Um, and we will be having a slightly modified webinar time next month. And that invite will go out. Um, pretty quickly here, so look for that coming up. Uh, we definitely would appreciate and enjoy having you on our next call also. Um, so with that, um, unless you have any last words, Chris, I want to say um, thank you so much, and uh, we'll hopefully be speaking with all of you relatively soon. Thanks, James.